Hello and welcome back to Lorcana Villain. My name is Baker and today we're taking a look at the top eight deck lists from a 2K which was hosted by Cerberus Den in Cincinnati, Ohio. This event took place on the 24th of March, so yesterday at time of recording. Uh, I've covered these guys before. They've run a few uh, successful tournaments. This uh, particular field was 40 players, so certainly enough for us to get some data. Um, so we're going to be taking a look at the lists and then at the end of the video, I'm going to talk I'm not not for ages, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, my thoughts on the two game format, which has been brought in for the um, the DLCs, the Disney Lorcana challenges, which in my one of my previous videos, I reported on the news and I said at the time that I didn't mind it, but I felt like I needed to think about it a bit more and um, uh, work out what side of the fence uh, I stood. So yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about um, my more conclusive feelings on that. And then we'll talk a little little bit about um, the drama that's been going on. I, I don't know if dra drama probably is the best word for it concerning the um, the cap for the events. We obviously got the rest of the events um, announced where they were going to be over the rest of the year. Um, and yeah, the Atlanta event were, went up and sold out in, I think, less than two minutes. It may have even been less than one minute. I, I, I don't know what the conclusive finish was, but yeah, sold out really quick. Um, a lot of disappointed people. Um, and then the, the exact same thing has happened for the France event uh, that was earlier on today. I myself was unsuccessful in it, uh, getting a ticket for that. Uh, it's not my most local tournament. It's the one in Birmingham that I'll be mostly looking to because that's the closest to me. But the one in France was still uh, close enough. Um, that would have been nice to go. Didn't happen for me, but it's just one of those things. But yeah, well, I'll talk a little bit about that whole um, d dilemma. Um, but let's start off, as always, by taking a look at the top eight deck lists. But not before I remind you that this channel is sponsored by Card Market. So check out Card Market for all your trading card game needs. So quite a healthy looking top eight. We've got four different um, ink combinations. First place was taken by Eric, who was running some Ruby Sapphire Dime Control. So taking advantage of Ruby's uh, control options, such as Be Prepared, the Maleficence. We've got a high count of the ladies in red here. Three Tremaines and three Medusas. Uh, we've also got Maui for some great board control. Queen of Hearts for the aggro decks and just so that we have a bit more early presence because this deck had, normally has a pretty slow first few turns and also utilising the Maui's fish hook, which obviously works great with Maui uh, and even without him just being able to raise strength or become evasive to either deal with evasive or just be annoying ourselves. It's fantastic. And then obviously in Sapphire, we've got all the ramp um, and some nice aggressive questing options. We've got Grandma Tyler here at a three count um, for some card draw just because that is what this deck is lacking. So it's nice to have something else that can at least plus one on you um, and again a little bit of a dig to find pieces that you need is important four copies of Flavisham to work with our items and be our primary drawing machine hopefully he's banishing a lot of items and drawing us a lot of cards we've got four copies of Gaston intellectual powerhouse when he's played top three look at the top three cards of your deck one into your hand and the other two go to the bottom of your deck in any order so we are plus one off this so it's card draw and helping us find a key piece plus the four four line is respectable um, questing for three is really good a six uh, uninkable obviously sucks but six isn't unreasonable especially because we're ramp we can have this online by turn four or five um, and he works particularly well with the lucky dime which we'll come to four copies of Tamatoa who's also going to work well with the lucky dime but even without it just if we've got a lot, a lot of items on the board then he's going to be questing all the all the greater recycling these items that Flavisham might have um, banished earlier on in the game drawing us cards and he's a 5'8 bulky boy we've got four copies of develop your brain to help us find key pieces that we might need four popsicle obviously works really well with the Flavisham it's card draw the healing can be relevant but more importantly it's just a cheap item and we are we we has the item synergies the fish hook as i mentioned we got four copies of fishbone quill for that accelerated ramp not nine times at nine times out of ten i don't know why i went irish then um but nine times out of ten the fishbone quill will be your preferred turn three play we are also running three copies of heart of defeaty here exert and pay two put the top card of your deck onto into your rink well face down and exerted so another well of accelerating this um, card, obviously not as aggressive as Fishbone Quill, because we can put Fishbone down on three, immediately immediately accelerate to four, and then on our turn four, we could potentially go up to six if we ink and then ramp a bit more with Fishbone Quill. Heart of VT is slower, but it comes off the top of our deck, so it doesn't take our hand resources away from us. We've got four copies of Maduck Manor, which is a big, bulky location, which if they don't have the answer for it, a 
immediately. It's going to start getting you some some fantastic lore gains with that two passive. Um, and then finally, the uh, pretty much the main event really um, is the two copies of Lucky Dime, seven cost uninkable, exert, pay two, choose a character of yours, and gain lore equal to their lore. So by the time you get to the like nine ink spot. If you've got a character on board, you can put down the dime, immediately tilt it to gain the lore of the character, or the other way around, you could already have the lucky dime on the board, and then you go into your turn with at least nine ink, um, and you're able to, say, throw down the... Ga well, it doesn't even have to be nine, you can throw down the Gaston and then immediately pay another two to get his lore immediately, and then if they don't remove your Gaston or your Tamatoa or whatever, or your Tremaine um, in their turn, then on your turn, not only are you questing for that lore, but you're getting another... Um, with the dime to get another law bump and if we get multiple dimes down this can like just steal the game out of nowhere so yeah a deck that is at uh, this point well rooted um in the meta and led to first place for eric so congratulations to them that is our only um, Sapphire Ruby deck. So going on to second place, we've got Alex with some Sapphire Steel Lucky Wheel. Um, with uh, looking a little bit different to a couple of the conventional lists that I've looked at recently. Not by loads, but a couple of things to specifically point out. We've got three copies of Captain Hook to be a nice one drop that can hit for three, which is that magic number in the early game. Four copies of Smee with a 3-3 three, three stat line and questing for two. Just a fantastic character. Yes, we can subvert the ability with the Captain Hook Captain, but we don't, we don't really care if we don't. Own. He hits hard, he's questing big, and he's cheap. Three copies of Detective Mickey for that accelerated ramp. We've got two copies of Benja here, respecting items. Fishbone Quills, um, the Sleepy's Flutes are very popular. Sorcerer's Spellbooks in Ruby Amethyst, Lucky Dimes, that's a lot of value. And questing for two is nice as well. We also we are also running two copies of Bell, Strange but Special. And this deck is running two copies of the Lucky Dime itself. And Be I think I was kind of hard on Bell all the way through Rise of the Floodborne. Like, I was always a bit like, I don't, I just don't know if I how I feel about Bell. Um, I, I wasn't sure if she was worth the slots, and I, I was never won over by Bell. But with Lucky Dime, absolutely, one hundred percent, because you get you not, more often than not, you're gonna get to her. You're gonna get to the ten ink. That was never the issue. It was her sticking around. And there's a whole argument there about well, there yeah, you still need to play her to make make them have removal, um, which is which is per perfectly valid. But with Lucky Dime, the fact that we can put her down and then immediately tilt for five that is fantastic so big fan of that Flavisham here for the draw three copies of Cogsworth with Ward so hard to remove um, and also questing for two if we feel safe too but again it's another character that we can just um, lucky dime quest uh, quest gain from we're also running two copies of Hard Headed Beast five cost inkable four four quest for two and break when you play this character you may banish chosen item so we've got a lot of item hate in here which can only be good um, items very much relevant in, in meta at the moment um, plus he is a target for our tragic hero beast which doesn't really serve our curve particularly well but hey there are going to be times where this 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 could be relevant um but more than anything he's another five cost character that can sing our five cost songs which is kind of the big deal with this deck um he's got the two lore which you're going to benefit from from lucky dime so yeah i really like hard headed beast as an inclusion here just two copies of the tragic hero beast which i think is perfectly reasonable some people moving away from them altogether just because they are so easy to offset. Uh, but if you can, let it stick for the turn and get an, 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 an extra draw for a turn, and it's still really good. So two copies here, three copies of Gaston we've talked about, especially at Synergy with Dime. We've got four copies of Giant Fairy Tinkerbell with that one sprinkle damage on everything on the opposing board when she enters play. And if she vanishes something, she's going to do two more chip damage to another character. So, 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 some, so she is some fantastic board control and always has been, probably always will be. Well, I say that. Will we ever get rotation? Will we? That's a different conversation. We've got four color bees of develop your brain to find those key pieces. We're also running the 1-1 one, one, fire the cannons and ba-boom line, um, which I first saw in, um, it was one of the online tournaments hosted by the pack, um, and it was in Zephyr's Jafar list, and he was on a one cannons, one smash, one ba-boom, and we did an interview in that video, and I was talking to him about it, and he was saying just fire the cannons is just so good, and something that you tend to want to hold in your opening hand especially if you're on the draw but if you do that um drawing into another fire the cannons kind of sucks so he opted to play the one baboon one fire the cannons so like at least 50 percent of that is an inkable option but you still have the option for even even if you're on the play then turn two baboon isn't bad uh, necessarily if there's not anything else you want to play on your turn two and depending on what you're facing um so yeah the one one line not the first time i'm seeing it and makes a little bit more sense to me 
at this point. Just one copy of a long came Zeus. I, I, I've, I've, I've read, I've sung my praises to this card. I like high counts of this, but second place only needed one. I respect it. Two copies of Let It Go for some hard removal. We're not seeing a Hades in here, so things like the resist in general is going to be annoying. Things like Stout Hearted Cinderella in particular. So this gives us an inkable answer to that, which will be relevant in other games, and it's singable from our five cost characters. Four copies of Whole New World for the hand refresh. Three grab your swords for the sprinkle damage, and then we've looked at all these items and locations of three copies of McDuck Manor. So yeah, um, this list, including the uh, uh, definitely some more item hate, the one one of Fire the Cannons and Baboom, which I really like. And yeah, the two, but to be honest, like in this particular deck with two dimes, I probably own at least three bell because that's such a powerful closer. I know from experience, it, uh, I was, I've been playing, I'm going back a few days, but um, I'm, I plan on doing a Mufasa deck profile video on the channel soon i know i said that in my last video and i've i've, I've been busy um but those games have, have been recorded they're, they're they're sitting and waiting i just need to do the video but yeah i was on like a 11 winning streak and the deck i ended up losing to was uh, a surprise bell dime um so yeah uh, you must respect it but yeah deck looks good sapphire steer i feel this at this point i feel this is wheel of fortune my name is bruce forsyth nice to see you to see you nice but yeah congratulations to alex we have one more Sapphire Steel Lucky Wheel. In top eight, we've got Zachary with um, a slightly different build. Um, Zachary opting to play the 4-4 Robin Hood line. The shift character being a five cost, shift for three. Three, six, which bad if you're facing Medusa. Good if you're facing a long came Zeus. Um, quest for two. Um, and if he banishes a character in the challenge, you gain two lore, which is a nice bump. And the good of others, if you're banished in a challenge, then draw a card. So yeah, Robin Hood, one of the standouts of this format. Another character that can sing these five cost songs um so love it no captain hooks in here but if you're playing the robin hood line i think this to be fair i think you could play both but i think this is fine four copies of mr smee even without captain is still good we're running three copies of benger no beast hard headed here but still three benger is a nice count of item hate so you'll have to see it we are running the three copies of bell strange but special in this deck to go with our two lucky dimes as i just said this will probably be the way i would go four copies of flavisham for the draw we got four copies of tra uh, tragic hero beast just upping those odds to hopefully one of these beasts sticks long enough to draw me some extra cards the four gaston the four tinkerbell just one copy of tamatoa we got the one baboon but no fire the cannons but two smash in here um two along came zeus the four wheel the four grab your swords the standard item counts for um, mcduck manor so the biggest change really is the lack of cogsworth um, and obviously the addition of Robin Hood. Other than that, it's just some count differences. And with this next running the two smash, one baboon. The previous was one baboon, one fire the cannons. So again, similar, but slightly different style. But led Zachary to top eight. So congratulations to them. Next up onto our Ruby Amethyst lists, of which there are three. First of all, in top four, not taking the crown or even the second place uh, this time round, we have Jordan with, looks pretty cookie, cookie cutter, but a nice high count of the ladies in red here. Four Tremaine and three Medusa. I am coming round more and more to like, I was on no Tremaine and then I was like, I feel like I want one. And now I do feel like I I, I think my count is probably, I've, I've been testing other things. Um, I'm a control main but I like to play other things um, for content as well. Um, but yeah, when I do come back to control or if it's like for a tournament setting, I think I'm leaning now more towards two Tremaine, two Medusa, um, possibly three Medusa. But yeah, a high count of the ladies here. We're running the four Shona Box followers, which is nice and diverse because we can either thin our deck, draw a card um, or just keep questing if we need to. Obviously, we're fueling our bounce mechanic cards, being a nice low cost and hitting for two is relevant and also opting for the four Rafiki, which again, a one cost, so serving our bounce and hitting for three is indeed a magic number. Choosing not to play the Olafs or the Mini. A lot of Ruby Amethyst players moving away from that in general. We've got four copies of Kuzgo Wanted Llama, who can be another chance to get a, a character down before turn three if we do miss these 8-1 drops. And a fantastic character just to pressure the board because you're always drawing a card when he's banished, so um, we, don't lose to, we don't lose card count. Four copies of Snake. We've got the four Fox. We've got two Crab in here to boost our character's strength, hit bigger bodies, hit locations, all the way on the four Maleficence, which I really like. We'll four rabbit four goat four copies of stylish surfer mini all the way in on this people are playing a lot of answers to it but jordan just saying hey if you've got the answers great if you ain't then i'm gonna i'm gonna get a lot of gas off of this mini um and probably at least one quest at the very least uh for maui we talked about the ladies the two maleficent four friends on the other side four be repaired and the one sorcerer's spell book which is just really good as a, as a mirror breaker so yeah pretty cookie cutter other than the i think the higher count of ladies in red is slightly 
slightly less common. Not unseen by any means, but yeah, a fantastic looking list and more and more players moving away from 1-3s for their 1-drops is certainly data to take into account. So congratulations to Jordan. Next up in top eight, we've got Dylan. Um, a little bit, sp a little bit of spice here. We see a couple of the more. Um, I don't know if you. Want, I, I suppose Pinocchio is tech. I think Maui's Fishhook is, like, pretty standard in most Ruby Amethyst lists. Wasn't in the previous list. I've always Pinocchio. That list was pretty, like, four ofs of as many things as possible. Pretty straightforward. Nothing too fancy. But this deck opting for the more tech sort of stuff. We've got the one Pinocchio for exerting. Just one copy, a copy of Maui's Fishhook. We're also seeing the one copy of Minnie Mouse in here. Just to be one option for some cheap gas if they don't have the evasive answer. We're seeing the one Dragon's Fire here. So a few one-offs here. Um, high count of ladies in red again. 3-3 um, three, three for both Tremaine and Medusa. The two Maleficent. A pretty standard packy. Oh, to be fair, we're running, we are running three Olaf here. So three of the one threes and then four Shadowbox followers, two coups goes, the standard bounce stuff. Um, we are seeing three copies of the Queen's Castle, two passive lore gain, one to move there, seven willpower, four cost inkable, and at the start of your turn, draw a card for every character there. So if that does stick, then you can get get some mad gains off of that and even just the passive law gain is important but yeah the most spicy thing in this particular list um we're seeing one copy of madam mim purple dragon seven cost inkable five seven for um quest for four evasive and I win, I win. When you play this character, banish her or return another two chosen character of your characters of yours to your hand. So we know that bouncing is not really a well, it is a cost, but it's not really seen as a, a bad thing um, in Lorcana. Being able to reuse all of these come into play abilities, um, the Pinocchio, the Crab, the Maleficent, um, obviously the Rabbit and the Goat, the ladies in red, the Maleficent. So yeah, lots of things here that we're going to recycle. And hey, if we get this down, they don't have an answer to it. Um, then questing for four is big, and we're evasive, and sevens big and bulky as well it kind of demands removal in a lot of situations um because even if they got the maui's fish hook if they've already got an evasive character and they can boost up to seven strength or more then fine um but a lot of the time they're using maui's fish hook as their evasive thing if they have got another evasive thing it's like mini um so you'd you'd need two fish hooks one to make you evasive and then to plus three um which is achievable if you if, like if you make your fox evasive and then make it uh, plus three then it does take out the purple dragon but that's very specific and you could get away with some cheeky things with this dragon uh one copy of the sorcerer spell book and your standard song count so yep deck looks good um Purple Dragon, definitely good to see. She pops up every now and then. I appreciate the spice. So congratulations to Dylan. To, to Dylan, words. And finally, of our Ruby Amethyst lists, also in top eight, we've got Reed um, opting for the same um, package of one drops that we saw from the first Ruby Amethyst list. Same four Kuzgos as well. So yeah, four Shonobogs, four Rafiki, four Kuzgo. We are seeing the two Pinocchio, Pinocchio in here. God, words have left me completely. Uh, the four Snake, the four Fox, a uh, higher count of Crab here. Just three Maleficent, four Goat, four Rabbit, four Maui. We are seeing the two Scary Beyond All Reason Ysmaer in here, who I'm a big fan of. Six Cost Inkable, four Four Quest for two and cruel irony when you play her we bounce a character from the field uh, back to their player's deck and that player the owner of that card draws two cards so we can say goodbye to a threat or we can bounce our own characters back to our deck just to draw more cards i'm a big fan of yzma e in this format we're seeing um a four a two four package of tremaine and madame medusa so putting a lot more favor in uh, the boss three maleficent four friends on the other side just three copies of be prepared i've said this before again i kind of get it especially in like with ursula in format you want to mulligan at mulligan it's out of your hand and you don't want to be drawing more um i still like the four personally but i understand it two copies of sorcerer spellbook i really like um and two maui's fish hook but yeah that looks really good i'm a big fan of the easement package to be honest this this is very similar to what i played although i played the the minis but i think i would probably swap to these one drops um i think just two kuzgo is fine just two crab is fine i'd want the fourth um, maleficent and i'd probably at the very least go to a two three of ladies uh, but i like the four the two spell book i like the two yzma i like the two pinocchio but yeah that looks good congratulations to them I'm going to do the last top four deck last because it's my favorite. Um, so we're going to top eight. We've got Taylor with some Amethyst Steel Jafar taking advantage of the Striking Illusionist. Seven cost inkable, four, five, shift five, evasive, quest for one, and power beyond measure. During your turn, while this character is exerted when you draw a card, 
gain one lore. So we can draw cards, obviously, via Yzma or Friends on the Other Side or the Dreadnought Jafar or the Blue Fairy. So this is a nice passive lore game, but really we want to play a whole new world and get a nice seven lore bump. And we don't even have to be all in on Jafar because just Steel Amethyst mid-range is inherently good. We're running the 4-4 Robin Hood line, who's just a good card in general, but another character that can sing our whole new world and our Grab Your Swords and our Along Came Zeus for some more control. Um, we've got the Blue Fairy here, who's going to let us draw cards from playing any of our Floodborne characters. So not just the Jafar, but we've got four Tinkerbells here, the Yzma we just mentioned, the Robin Hoods we just got we just mentioned. We've got four copies of Tragic Hero Beast here. We've got four copies of the Dreadnought Jafar. So playing any of these is going to let us draw cards. We've got four Maleficent for the more card draw. We are running three copies of the Royal Vizier Jafar, which is another target for our Striking Illusionist to shift onto, and an Evasive Answer, which is lovely, lovely, lovely. Four copies of Benja, really respecting items, a lot of item hate. Also three copies of Tiny Tactician Tinkerbell, because turn four, um, uh, Big Tink can just win games. Um, I really like the Tiny Tactician inclusion. The, the Dreadnought Jafar, obviously, as I said, can shift onto the Royal Vizier, um, can be a target for the Striking Illusionist, illusionist to shift onto, and a really nice stat line and effect, letting us draw cards when he banishes characters, and 3-4 is really nice. 3 takes out a lot of um, common targets, and 4 survives a lot of things, because 3 really is that magic number. So, yeah, a fantastic looking Jafar deck. We've got the 3 copies of the Queen's Castle down here, which I also like. So, yeah, Jafar once again poking his head into the top eight pretty much as i predicted not gonna uh, not dominating um top cuts by any means but to be respected a good deck that can absolutely top so congratulations to taylor and finally um going back to top four we've got daniel with some steel amber tempo i think um so no we got no general song package here. We've got the four bare necessities and the four grab your swords, but this is not a Steel Amber songs list. No aerial, um, none of those singing shenanigans. Don't get me wrong, of course we can't. We have songs here that we can sing and that we have a high count of five cost characters that can sing grab your swords being our most expensive one, but not the main theme of the deck. We're running three copies of Lantern to play characters cheaper, two cost uninkable, exert, you pay one less ink for the next character you play this turn. So that's going to make things cheaper. We've also got four copies of Doc here three cost inkable two three quest for two whenever this character quest you may pay one less for the next character you play this turn um and not even mufasa's here i mean there's some simbas here we'll get to him but yeah i mean i think i would probably find room for mufasa in a deck looking like this but i'm sure daniel has play tested this to high heavens and has probably thought of it and this was probably better um but still a really cool looking deck we're running a 2-4 queen line commanding presence another character that we can shift early to sing grab your swords but again that's not really the main point here uh, but she quests for two and we can manipulate the strength of on board characters so help gonna help our um lower cost characters um hit bigger numbers and good for get stretching to location numbers that we need um i'm not a huge fan of the queen even though i was playing her in my mufasa deck and um, but she she does have a purpose like again locations and big bodies a deck like this can struggle with um so it's an answer to that we've got four copies of captain hook for another one drop four copies of mr smee which i've obviously said many times is very good just a really cheap nice aggro character with a with a big body and um hits for that magic three four copies of benja so respecting items um four copies of rapunzel for card so our card draw is the four copies of rapunzel and um, we've got four copies of tragic hero beast um, and then Simba has some kind of card draw. But we've also got four copies of Tinkerbell here, who I'm a big, big fan of, is in my Mufasa deck. Um, love her. And then just... She you don't need to be working with Mufasa for her. Like, she just works really well with Lanterns, being able to play turn three Tinkerbell. Um, the stat line is nothing to shout, like, to scream about. One, four. I mean, four is okay. Like, so you will survive some things. At least it's more than three. We, we appreciate that. Um, and the questing for one is met and obviously uninkable. But it's just to be our guest on a body. Which is really strong. Again, being able to play it on turn three. Um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of this Tinkerbell. She's put a lot of work for me and Mufasa of being able to fish out characters. And this deck isn't playing a lot of non-characters. Um, so yeah, big fan of this. We're also running four copies of Maximus, who's a bodyguard of a 4-5 stat line. Um, five cost inkable quest for one. And also support, which can come in handy to, again, hit those bigger numbers that we need for bigger bodies and locations. Two copies of Hard-Headed Beast are making their way into this deck. A lot of item hate. It was the item hate decks, it seemed, that did the best in this particular tournament. And um, we've got the four Tinkerbell. And yeah, we're running four copies of Simba, Fighting Prince. Seven cost inkable 
available. 5-7, quest for 2. And step down or fight. When you play this character and whenever he quests... Sorry, and whenever he banishes another character in a challenge... When questing would probably be too good. Uh, would it? Uh, different conversation. But yeah, not when he quests, when he banishes a character. Um, you choose one of these abilities. You, are gonna, you can either draw two cards and discard two cards. So you're not getting any plus, but you're, you're fishing for the pieces that you need. Or you can deal two damage to chosen character, which we're running swords, we're running Tinkerbell. So we've got ways of like hitting chip and just getting these numbers to what we need them to be to get our knockouts to get our banishments um so yeah i, li I liked this card the first time i saw it um and has definitely un I, I wasn't expecting it to be like in every steel deck ever but i i, I felt like it would show i felt it was going to have made an appearance before now to be honest um and i very quickly came around to the conclusion that i was probably just wrong and it's probably just not a bad card but just not really worth the slot but i'm really glad to see daniel leading it to four copies of it um to a top four finish in this particular tournament and it's another way that we can really easily set up the one copy of Chernobog that we've got 10 cost uninkable 9 9 quest for three each character in your discard you pay one ink less to play this character and when you play the character you shuffle your discard back into your deck um so a deck like this should go through characters quite quickly anyway with our queen line we've got these early drops like hook smee doc normally gets taken out pretty quickly um tinkerbell isn't doing much. Uh, we should be able to flood our discard quite reasonably quickly. And we can do it even quicker with Simba by just like cycling through our cards in our deck. Um, so yeah, I really like it. I'd like to see a Hades in here. More for just like... If you miss that, like if you if your Chernobyl gets whole new worlded away, um, be nice to be able to instantly get it back out and then probably instantly play it again. Um, but still, I like it. I like the synergy, and I've mentioned obviously four copies of Bare Necessities, fantastic for getting rid of those whole new worlds. Be prepared, grab your swords, whatever it is you're worried about, um, and a high count of grab your swords and the lanterns, as we said. So yeah, really cool looking deck. Another one that I definitely want to try out. Really glad to see Simba fighting Prince. <laughs> he was like, "Get out of here, Dad. You're not needed." I'm better than you. But yeah, huge congratulations to Daniel in a top four finish. This channel is also sponsored by What's Not. If you're not already a What's Not customer, you can sign up using my link to get £10 off your first purchase. And that's it for the top eight deck lists for the Cerberus Den 2K event. A nice diverse set, um, set of lists. So love to see that. Good to see the Simba, the new Steel Simba, putting in some work. So yeah, it looks like it was a fantastic tournament. So let's move on now. I don't want to linger on this too much. And to be honest, I'm basically going to be reading the words of other people who have done a far better job of putting into words how I feel um, about a couple of things. Let's start off talking about the two-game format, which, if you still don't know, for the DLCs, the Disney Lorcana Challenge events, um, Swiss will be... Every opponent you face, you will only ever play a maximum of two games. It's, they're not doing two out of three until they get to top cut, which is going to be top 32, by the way. Um, when it gets to top 32, that goes to elimination, and those will be two out of three games. But for Swiss, it's two-game format. You get a point for every game that you win. So if, I w if I'm playing you, and I win the first game, and you win the second game, then that's it. We don't play a third game, and we get a point each. If I win the first game and we don't finish the second game, then I get a point, you don't get anything. And if I beat you 2-0, I get three points. So I get one point for each of the two wins that I got, and then I get an additional point for not losing any. So my first reaction to this, mostly, was I wasn't too bothered about it. And if anything, it just says to me that the people that are going to be making the top cuts are going to be the players that are most consistently just 2 0 their opponent. And that, to me, sounds good enough to warrant your inclusion in a top cut if you are getting those sort of results. And then the more I thought about it, it was like, well really they're creating four different categories now before the what like you after a round you either won you lost or you drew so you there were three categories of which to divide you into but with this new format and also worth mentioning whoever wins this if it's 1-1 whoever won the second game gets a better tiebreaker so it is more important to win the second game because of that before you play game one when you do the dice roll, whoever wins the dice roll chooses if they want to go first in game one or game two. That's the way it works. But yeah, essentially, we now have four categories to divide players into. Either you went win-win, you went win-lose, you went lose-win, 
or you went lose-lose. So that just extra category to divide players into just says to me that you're going to be more consistently paired with someone closer to the level of success that has been reflected. Like, I don't want to say your skill level because your skill level isn't always reflected in your performance because RNG is still a factor. Um, a better player can lose game one to someone that might not be as good of a player um, just because RNG is still a factor in a game. But yeah, I wasn't too mad about it, but I want to draw attention to a post that I found on Twitter by someone named Nicholas, who the name's familiar. I've, I've, I've seen I've seen their, um, they've come up in my newsfeed before, um, but they put out a particularly interesting tweet, which I'm going to read through now. Um, for our league today, we tried best of two. I'm not going to be calling it best of two because Ravensburger don't want that. Um, so I'm going to be calling it two game format. Although someone did say um, quest for two, a quest of two, which I thought was quite funny, but it's two game format. Disclaimer. Yes, I know we don't have official rules yet. How we run the event likely won't be 100% to what comes out on Monday, but we have lots of experienced players and agreed upon something fair and logical. Verdict, two game format is great. We had 13 players, which is average for our weekly league. A couple of things need to, needed to be ironed out. In the spirit of some of the things Ravensburger is trying to accomplish with two game format, we decided no intentional draw and all games must have a determined winner. That's another good thing about this new format. It it will lessen the amount of players that will be happy to take an intentional draw um, because every game matters, every point matters. You're going to be wanting to 2-0 your opponent more often than not. Your, your place won't be as secure as it was. So I'm a fan of that. We used the end of round rules uh, RB established at Gen Con last year. Five turns, then law totals, first law change if tied. We also used used me uh, melee to run the event player sweeps 2-0 enter as such 1-1 one, one split enter as such the match points end up working out the same as well the win lose versus lose win second tiebreaker had to be kept manually which was pretty simple just keep a tally of who won games two in 1-1 one, one situations and use that if needed spoiler it never mattered again i know this isn't exact but it's close. We ran 40 minute round timers. Here are the final standings. Number one, players loved knowing exactly where they stood as the event went on, especially those in the middle of the pack, instead of there being a glut of players at X1 or X2 and things coming down to tiebreakers. They had concrete point totals with easy to understand rankings. Two, every game matters. If you want to win or top an event, you still have to win games. Things get really interesting when point differentials between players are one and two points instead of main, mainly multiples of three. Extrapolate this to the challenges. You are going to see every match in the final rounds having major implications with invites and prizes being won or missed by single points. Some may see this as bad, but I see it as the type of tension that makes these high stake events great for both players and spectators. Point number three, shorter rounds leads to a short leads to shorter days, which leads to less fatigue, which leads to overall higher quality gameplay. This also means even with a nine round event, the rounds can be over at a decent time where you aren't forced to have fast food dinner at 10 p.m. and can actually actually enjoy a meal or night out visiting a new city. With our 40 minute rounds, not a single match went to time. Obviously, zero games going to time is unrealistic for a large scale event, but this is incredibly promising. Choosing whether to take the play in games one or two adds another strategic element. Players all event were discussing various strategies regarding this. Does this influence your deck choice? Does your deck choice influence this? Do you make different choices in early rounds versus later rounds? What if you know what deck your opponent is on before the match? In the end, two game format is 90% of the same experience as best of three, but with so many benefits. If you want to win or top finish, you still have to win games just like best of three. You still have to break serve and win games on the draw just like best of three, unless you are the luckiest ever. 
I'm still going to reserve full judgment until after Atlanta, but based on this local event, I know, I think best of two, um, two game format is a huge win for Lorcana. So a couple of things, obviously, we don't know that official events are going to be 40 minute rounds. They will probably still be 50 minute rounds, but I still think the point about fatigue is something to take into account and um, you will play less games per round, which not everyone is going to look at as a good thing. Some players are just going to be like, I don't care. I'd rather like play more games and have a like have the chance of winning the two out of three. And that's a perfectly valid point. But I thought this was a really interesting um, read to go through. And again, I know 13 players isn't the biggest field. But again, I think it's data to certainly take a look at. It's a group that have tried it out. I know that Tia and the pack for the next online Easter event are planning on trying out the two game format. So I think after results of that, which will be probably a 100 to 200 person field that will be very telling um again I'm, I'm still not completely sitting on one side of the fence or the other i'm much more on the side of i think this is just fine i, I think this all sounds good um i definitely like the idea that you're going to be closer match to people on a similar record to what you have achieved um but i still agree we still need to see this on a larger scale like nicholas mentioned the like the Atlanta event will be the real telling tale. Um, obviously, I think the event that T is running will definitely help, and it'll be very interesting to see how players feel about that after that event. But so far, I'm not mad about two game format. But let me know your thoughts down below. And the last thing I want to talk about is just concerning the um, the, the cap being met for the two events that have been that tickets have gone on sale for so far, Atlanta and um, and France, not Paris. Um, but yeah, obviously it's a shame. I've seen a lot of a lot of opinions, um, a lot of people venting their frustrations. And for what it's worth, I absolutely support everyone's right to vent frustrations and to hold companies accountable for things that they should be held accountable for at the same time uh, i've been quite disappointed at some takes coming across just kind of rude um but again i say that and i'm all i always try and i've tried to grow as a person over the years and i try more and more to remember that like not everyone looks at rude the same way um it's it, it this t it speaks to a much deeper problem really um i call it the emoji problem which is the simple act of um the way you text someone you could go hello are we meeting today question mark which depending on the, obviously if it's someone that you don't know and it's a professional setting it's fine but to a friend you might think no emojis, no, hey, how are you? You know, some people like to color their talking and like whether it's through verbally or via messaging. I'm one of those people. I, I like, I go to the effort of uh, make, trying to match my tone to written format, but not everybody feels the need to do that. Uh, so I, I always try and think, okay, just because you're, I might be reading something as rude just because it sounds quite blunt doesn't mean it's necessarily intended that way. So I always try and keep a level head on these things. Um, that being said, if you're going after any of the actual staff on the Discord and name calling and like going too far, and again, but what, what does going too far really mean? Um, but I think you know if you're just being rude just for the sake of it and just shouting at the one representation that we have of the company, which is basically Rochelle, um, who is, bless her, has had to suffer so much of the brunt. Um, uh, but yeah, let's talk about it by me once again reading what someone else said, which I admit is kind of a cop-out, but it's not an intentional cop-out. It's just, I think this sums up basically my opinion on the whole thing. And this was a post by Mushu Report, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, very established content creator, a pillar in our, in, in our community. Um, and they made a really interesting tweet, which I completely agree with. A bit late to the conversation, but I just wanted to share my thoughts. The Atlanta event sold out very fast, and it's a sign that interest in Lorcana is very high. However, many people have been disappointed um, as they were not able to sign up for the event. 
I have run events for over 10 years and booking venues is one of the toughest parts of planning an event, especially when there is no past data to go by. Venues are not just expensive, but also very hard to book. To book a decent 500 plus PAX venue, venues have to be booked at least three to six months ahead and often even earlier, which means many of the challenge venues had to be booked much earlier when the Lorcana team had minimal data on tournament numbers. Furthermore, based on the stance of the organizers booking venues, any organizer would rather book a suitably sized hall which is filled as opposed to booking one that is too big and only has one corner utilized. With the signups for the first event done and with some basis on numbers to work on, we can expect the cap to increase for future challenges and allow more people to play in these events. That said, the Lorcana team is doing a fantastic job speaking to the community and sharing some of their internal processes and also what the team is doing to improve things in the future if you did not manage to sign up for atlanta i'm sorry that you that you did not manage to get in and hopefully you managed to get a slot for the other upcoming challenges and it's accompanied by a photo a screenshot from a post by rochelle in the disney law kind of discord i absolutely understand the fr who is the community manager by the way if you didn't know i absolutely understand the frustration and hear you what i said on the stream has been the plan we see how this goes and reevaluate the cap this is the first competitive event for the game while it's easy to assume there would have been a lot of hype many of us internally thought this might happen we also need evidence of it the fact that it sold out this quickly sends a message that we can take back and discuss and potentially take action to improve the situation at the end of the day the Lorcana core team that are working on this game 99% of them i dare say were 99% sure that this would happen and this this game was going to be hype i of course absolutely felt the same thing i've committed a, i opened a brand a complete new youtube youtube channel for it and committed hard um i don't want to say from day one but very early on like first couple of weeks of chapter first chapter being released i can't even remember when i started my channel now but i've been here pretty from pretty early on and yeah i many of us can look at this and go it's disney of course it's gonna sell but disney do loads of side ventures loads of stuff think of the amount of disney things that have a disney cut coat of pain in all walks of entertainment they can't look at all of them and go it's disney of course it's gonna succeed because that's just not always the case yes uh, like I said very early on it's a Disney card game of course it's going to succeed so yes I think that but that's not how business works and at the end of the day I'm sure all the Ravensburger team thought that this would happen would have been perfectly happy to have booked bigger maybe, well maybe not I don't want to speak for them but I'm sure what it came down to at the end of the day was higher uppers that's not good English but people in head office the suits the people that really make these decisions they they're not going to let you they're not going to increase funds and let you book a potentially much bigger venue than you need and multiple venues all this time in advance until they have solid data of their own game and yes you could argue look at this game look at this game they don't care they want to see it for this and i think that's totally understandable yes it is a shame for like the, uh, the 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 really competitive players that are really passionate about the game and just want to see it succeed and just want to see all of the competitive players playing at the highest level but not only that this game isn't all about the competitive players i'm sorry but it just isn't. And I say that as someone that does see myself as a competitive player, but I'm just as much of a Disney fan. But I care about the competitive side of it. I want to do well as a player more than just as a content. Obviously, I want to do well as a content creator. But I want to do well as a player. I'm right there with you. I've been a competitive player of Yu-Gi-Oh! Pokemon. I am competitive. So I get it. But it's not all about the competitive players. It's about creating family atmospheres. It's about... A bit, it, they want it to be just as much for Disney fans. And I think considering that, they've still done a lot for competitive players. And yeah, it's not been perfect the first time round. But they are learning. And not long ago... And I'll end on this. They made a tweet four hours ago after everything else I've read. Saying, we are looking at options for increasing the player caps to all Disney Lorcana Challenge events. And adding additional tickets to the events that have already sold out in the meantime we will delay further ticket sales going live until we come to a decision on event caps uh, this may be cap but this says to me emergency meeting happened
<laughs> Maybe not. Sorry, I'm clapping. I, I, I've been called out for my clapping in the past. But I'm feeling passionate. I'm feeling things. Um, but yeah, like this, this, this early, this is a really quick response. This says to me, like, these numbers have been have allowed the, the, the team to call a meeting with the powers that be, the relevant people, and said, look, look at all this. Let's take their money. And hopefully the suits went, yes. So yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say on the matter. Um, two game format, I I'm not mad about it. I think it sounds pretty good. Um, but again, I, I completely embrace we need a bigger pool of data. Um, the online event hosted by Tier, I think will help. But it'll be the obviously the, the actual Atlanta event, which will be really the, the what gives us the data we need but i like the idea of it personally and then yeah concerning tickets i'm sorry to people that didn't manage to get one i understand frustration um i support your right to voice that frustration but let's try and remember there are human beings the other sides that a lot of them that are actually responding responding to you had nothing to do with it um and then it's that situation where it's like well yeah i know that but i still deserve to be able to vent my frustration and i get it it's it's hard man it's a hard life and I don't have all the answers for you, other than just try and be nice. But that's it from me for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you're brand new to the channel, please subscribe for all things Lorcana. Hit the like button to show your support, and we'll see you soon.